hello, hello, and welcome to Temple of the False Pod, where our decks are not optimized, but our plays sure as heck are fun. I'm Andy. I'm Bruce. And uh, welcome. Oh my god. And Frankie's here too. Hey! Um, <laughs> Hi, yes, I know. Um, <laughs> where was I? Uh, this is episode 8 of the season, which means it's deck tale time. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and. Bruce already brought his deck in this season, so it's my turn for show and tell. Uh, but first, uh, as of recording, and I'm springing this on Bruce, the holiday card was previewed and showcased. Um, I'm sending it to you now. And since we talked about holiday cards last year, I figure we'll keep up with them. Uh, we're not going to spend too much time on it, because this is very straightforward. It's called Chaos Wrap. Of course it's it is. It's an instant for two and a red, uh, like, like Chaos Warp. The owner of Target Permanent shuffles it into their library. Okay. Uh, then they look at the top card of their library and may wrap it. Uh, we'll explain that in a second. If it's a permanent card, they may put it onto the battlefield. Otherwise, they put it onto the battlefield face down as a 4-4 red present creature. Uh, new creature type out there for you guys. Uh, it is an acorn card, so... Uh, be, be aware of that. Uh, and it says, to wrap a card, put it inside lots of sleeves. Doesn't doesn't denote card sleeves, by the way. Yeah. Um, if it would be dealt damage or destroyed, remove a sleeve from it instead. So, uh, shield counters. Yeah. It's cool. It's fun. It's cute. It's chaos. It's chaos warp. But uh, you get essentially shield counters on things, and it's not a total whiff if you hit a non-creature. Right. Or non-permanent, I guess. And see, this is another one. Why the acorn? The sleeves. <laughs> I, I get that, but should it really be that hard for you to be able to say to your buddies and your friends and everybody else you're playing with, I've got Chaos Wrap in my deck. Instead of putting whatever card comes up in multiple sleeves, how about we just put four shield counters on it mm. and you have to do damage to it four times before it starts taking damage? Is that broken? Is that really that broken? Right. I know plenty of people who double sleeve their cards. Right. So like, if... It's played in one of those games. Do they have to start taking off their sleeves? I mean, obviously, they could just be like, ah, it's destroyed, whatever. But, um, like, shield counters just seem seem like the way that this should have gone, for one. And I get that, you know, it wouldn't well, be wrapped. And, right. like, I like that aspect. Yeah. I like the unaspect of it. Well, yeah, um, I mean, it has to be phrased that way. And I get that. And they have to tell you it's going to be sleeved because... You know, you're wrapping the gift, and that that whole, that all fits, and I, I appreciate that. But come on, friends, can can we just all mm. agree that this is how it's going to work? Um, and like you said, it doesn't. Nothing denotes a sleeve. So right. in theory, you can perfect fit a sleeve, another sleeve, and then put it into a uh, a thin envelope, and then another slightly larger envelope, and then a hard case, and then something else, and something. Uh, it, it, you know, if if you want to go down that route, then go for it because I think you can easily set it up so that your card is now wrapped by you know ten or fifteen layers, yeah, of whatever. It's interesting too because it being wrapped also denotes this idea that it's very hard to read. Like yeah, like you know, wrapped presents you don't really know what's inside. So <clears throat> as you wrap it more and more, you're gonna like not necessarily forget, but if you have a generally wordy card. Like having the specific wording is going to be a little bit more difficult, mm. and there comes some of the fun of sh sure, yeah. Um, and it's just so it's so goofy. Yeah, um, I really like this but, one. Uh, I I think that there have been a few duds in the in in, yeah. in the recent past, but this to me this is a card that's actually playable. You can you can play with this card. You can use it in a deck. I think that you're all, almost always going to target yourself, right? Because you you're because you're giving them a four four. A four four that could very well be yeah. significantly indestructible. Oh yeah, because it gets wrapped even if it is a four four. <clears throat> I mean, even if it is a non permanent. Right. Don't and worry. the the cool thing too is like you know say it's like a land that they don't need. Uh, it is a may clause as well, so you don't have to put it down as a land. You can choose to make it a four four. Right. Uh, face down, of course. Yeah. So anyway, uh, <laughs> back to our regular cool. scheduled programming. Ding, ding. Um, I brought my deck in today, and uh, I want to tell you all about it because it's a lot of fun. Um, 
part if any of you watched the brainstorm brewery uh, edh stream that we were on on october 30th i played this deck and uh you know, as of recording this tomorrow, so hopefully it did well. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, or at least did the thing it wants to do, because doing deck here is all about getting your opponents to kind of let their guard down in terms of being a little bit greedy. Because uh, this deck is Vazi, Keen Negotiator. She's one of the non-face commanders from the new Capenna Commander okay. decks. Uh, she's two black, red, green, so five mana uh, for a three, three with haste. Human advisor. Uh, she says tap target opponent creates X treasure tokens, where X is the number of treasure tokens you created this turn. So we're we're looking at something fairly political. Uh, and then it says whenever an opponent casts a spell. Or activates an ability. If mana from a treasure was spent to cast it or activate it, put a plus one plus one counter on target creature, then draw a card. So, what I like is that uh, it that second line. Um, first off, doesn't denote that it has to be a treasure that you gave them, and second, it uh, it doesn't denote that it can only happen once per turn, like a lot of these cards lately have yeah. been saying. I wanted um, to ask about that. So. This is whenever an opponent casts a spell or activates an ability, not every time mm-hmm. they sack a treasure. Correct. Okay. So if on a turn uh, you create five treasures, you can tap that, give five treasures to one of your opponents. If they use yep. all five treasures uh, to cast a single spell, you get one plus one plus one counter. Yes, and a card. Right. But if they're, uh, uh, if they're playing, say, Grenzo, mm-hmm. and they activate Grenzo for two, Every time they activate, you get a plus one plus one counter. If they're using treasure each time. As long yeah. as they use treasure each time. Right. So, so if someone decides to play Grenzo in that same game <laughs> and happens to have a Hearthstone out and gets five treasures and sacks all five of them to use Grenzo's ability for one mana each, you would get five plus one plus one counters? Yes, and I'm not saying uh, that this is cool. Oh, and you draw five uh, cards. Right, right, right. All right. I draw a card each time as well. Yes. Um, so I I pulled this card out of, I think, like some set boosters or something. Um, and yeah. what I like about this card is that uh, it, it feels on the line of a legendary creature that they didn't necessarily want you to be the head of your deck. They, like, it feels like... The, the, <clears throat> Throughout the past, I don't know, three or four years, they've had legendary creatures for story's sake, yeah. where they're not they're not good cards. Uh, so like you'd never play them as your commander. But then they also have you know cards that they really push uh, design wise, and it's clear that they want you to be you know aware that this is like a good commander, and this feels on that line. So um, what I decided to do with this card is. When doing my first pass, I wanted to put in as many things that made treasures so that I could give my opponents as many treasures as possible. Okay. Um, So, quick question. Were you looking to give your opponents one treasure? Or were you looking to give them a pile of treasure? um, Because, I mean... When I first... Yeah, when I first built this deck, it was as many as I could. Because... It meant that I am also getting that many treasures. Like, I've already made those treasures. Sure. Like, as a political move, I can, like, help out other people. And where it kind of evolved from there is down into that second line of, like, okay, like, it also mentions drawing cards and plus one, plus one counters. Uh, So it very quickly became make treasures, give things plus one, plus one counters. And the, like, if even just like a quick glance at this deck list, it's it's clear that it needs some some work, but uh, it is also clear that it has those two very obvious routes here. Um, the first thing I found out after playing these decks is that the meta I was playing in didn't use treasures very much. So uh, <laughs> even I if I gave them, tre- I'm a big part of that meta. 
even if they I gave them treasures, they were hesitant hesitant to use them, and also didn't like I I would mention like each turn in each round like hey let me know if you need some mana or some treasure, they would be hesitant to take me up on that offer because they knew that it would benefit me. So it wasn't necessarily that like sh- they saw the benefit they're getting out of it. They just didn't want me to get a benefit out of it as well. Um, which, you know, is fine. But playing a group hug deck that this is uh, makes it a lot harder. Uh, so I knew I had to, I had to like up up the treasure factor because I mean it's 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 a very similar line to like similar not same uh, to uh, like the the what's it called the the cycle that you love where it's like oh like if I get something you get something and then if you uh, if like the next person gets it you also get yeah uh, tempt the tempt yes. with whatever tempt with discovery yeah, tempt, tempt with, with whatever vengeance. yeah um so. I was hoping that my opponents would be like, wow, like he just made like six treasure. I wish like, like I, I know that he can also give me that. So like if, if like I make a deal with him, maybe he'll give me six treasure and I'll like do him a favor, you know? Uh, otherwise it just becomes, I make a butt ton treasure and everybody comes after me, which uh, was also a fault in this deck when I first built it. Um, and one might say that it could still be there as a whole, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, uh, yeah. So I think the fact that she has haste inherently is extremely important because, uh, I hadn't even noticed. you can, yeah. you can give it, you can give away treasure immediately. Um, and she doesn't need to be on the battlefield right. when you make treasure. Um, and, like, it, for that turn. Um, and, uh, you can use treasure, and it's still, it's, it's like Storm Count, where it's like, okay, like, if I, you know, use two treasure to make four more treasure, you know, I've made, and I made those two before, like, I've made six. So it's like, it, it's cumulative, which is good as well. Uh, it helps out with the, the negotiation factor of it all. Um, Andy, before you get started, yeah. I'm going to go straight to the making treasure section. All right. That um, makes sense. So, Ancient Copper Dragon. Have you played yes. this yet? Has, has no. it come out? Because, I mean, no. that... It, you're, you're averaging, what, ten and a half treasures? Yeah. Is that the... Yeah. Ten and a half treasures. Every time this thing deals combat damage to a player, that's... Wow. It, yeah. If, there's a there's an old card with the uh, with the flavor text that says, "I'm sorry, we've destroyed your city. Here's some gold." <laughs> I mean, you know, ancient copper dragon flies over, does six. Oh, uh, here I'll tap, take nine. Here have nine treasures. Yeah, right. You know, in lieu of me having dealt you six in the air from this. Yeah. And should you I use think... them, I would appreciate that. That would be great. Honestly, I think that uh, it is like a very good negotiating piece in this a pawn if you will uh because of that and i mean i i got this because we did a draft of of this set which was the commander uh, legends baldur's gate right uh draft and i i mean i have played one game of commander since then so yeah no uh this is this is i think the newest addition to the deck right uh and i'm very excited to see how it works Oh yeah. Uh, though I fear that it won't get very like I I fear I won't be able to untap with it, which you know fair. It it seems um, it does seem likely. This is a uh, uh, draws removal kind of card. So yeah, yeah. Um, but I was curious. I mean, I absolutely should be here. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so we have that. Which uh, for those who don't know, it's a six five with flying. Great. It's a dragon. Makes sense. Uh, for four red red. Uh, and whenever it deals combat damage to a player, roll a d20. You create a number of treasure tokens equal to the result, which is different than old Gnawbone, which I don't have in this deck because it is costly. So that's why I have that in there. Doubling season, d- you double your treasure. Uh, Just to be clear, folks, that doubling season, it doubles the treasure. 
It doubles the plus one, plus one counters. So this can get really stupid if you've got an opponent who's willing to play along, because if you get two treasures, you get four instead. You tap, you give, uh, target opponent gets four, and it's the opponent, so they don't get to double. But if they use them, you get two plus one, plus one counters, not one, and then you get to draw a card. Yeah, you're you're inviting all kinds of fun. Fane the Broker, because it's my pet card. Yep. Uh, it's a two and a black, three, three. Uh, human warlock, you can tap, sacrifice a creature, but two plus one plus one counters on target mm-hmm. creature. You know, doubling season, that's four. Great. Okay. Tap, remove a counter from a creature to create a treasure. Tap, sacrifice an artifact or probably a treasure uh, to create a 2 1 white and black inkling creature token with flying, which is great if you need blockers or if you want to loop back to the beginning to put more counters on things. Uh, it's great. Uh, and then three and a black to tap. I mean, to untap. Right. Uh, so, so if you you can generate quite a bit of treasures, creatures, counters, etc. I'm sure that this and a few things in this category make for infinite treasures. But you need it's you know it's like five or six cards. You know. Yeah. So like it's, you have this doubling have make, season, yeah. Jolene and Zorn. Right. Like there will be some work. Yeah. Glittermonger. When I was building this deck, I had this affinity for, like, using cards within the set because I knew that they were going to be fairly well synergistic. Right. Um, So, I mean, Glittermonger, it's a 1-4 that taps to make a treasure. Yeah. Uh, It's a great blocker that at the end of turn or right before it dies, you tap it to create a treasure. Yeah. Jolene, beautiful, marvelous card. Scary as hell. (laughs) Uh, two a red green for a two two, but it says whenever a player attacks one or more of your opponents, that attacking player creates a treasure token. So this is another pillow fort type card, but uh, it is also fairly group huggy in the way that people will be getting things out of the the pillow fort right. aspect. Yeah. Um, also, it counts towards you as well. Uh, so if you attack one of your opponents. Yes, you'll also you be would get a treasure. treasure. Right. If you would create one or more treasure tokens, instead create those tokens plus one. Nice. So that's so cool. Attack your opponent, get two treasures. Yeah. Or if you have doubling season out, get four. four. And then sacrifice five treasures to put five plus one plus one counters on Jolene. Which, amazing. Marvelous. Fantastic. Uh, most Wanted is a fun little flash <laughs> enchantment that you can use as a as a way combat to, trick yeah. or save your creature or get some treasure. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Pitiless Plunderer, uh, fantastic card from Ixalan. Mm-hmm. Whenever a creature you control dies, you get a treasure, uh, which works wonderfully with Fane. Um, sacrifice a creature, you get a treasure, and you get two plus one counters uh, right. with Fane, of course. Uh, Professional Facebreaker, the most amazing card. I love this card to death. Two and a red for a 2-3, Menace. Whenever one or more creatures you control deal combat damage to a player, create a treasure token. Uh, so obviously you're not going to get one for each creature that deals combat damage, but say you have Double Strike, you're going to get one for each time you deal combat damage. And then also if you're running low on cards, you can <coughs> sacrifice a cre- uh, treasure to exile the top card of your library, and you may play that card this turn. I'm never uh, sure. If you attack multiple opponents, are you getting... Two treasures? Yes. Excellent. Yes. Um, sure. uh, Revel in Riches. I had to put this card in here because it does the thing. Uh, right. You and I've I have said talked this about many. This. Yeah. Yeah. We've we've talked about this on the show before, I'm sure. I've put this on Twitter before. I, I wish I could just scratch out that bottom part. Uh, and, like, technically I can. But I think if I was to get it to happen... Everyone would under like the rest of the game would be like, uh, we're under the pretense that Andy already won. Um, right. And the difficulty with this one, if it's out there with Jolene, because Jolene wants yeah. five treasures. So you're mm. always trying to keep five treasures, but at the same time, you're trying to say to everybody else, no, no, I know this deck breaks stupid amounts of treasures suddenly, but I'm not trying to win that way, really. And everybody's right. like, yeah, you're not even trying to. And right. so, so it can be tricky that way, but um. I, th- I think it's the, the yeah, I think it's the pinnacle of how treasures have affected game design in the past few years, right? Because I think that like 
if this card wasn't a thing, it would be a lot, sure. And I think the 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 format would be ultimately faster as a result of there just being an overabundance of treasure. But I think this card specifically just makes it suck. <laughs> and like there have been so many times where I'm like, I just want triggers off of my opponent's creatures dying to get treasures, but I don't want the 10. Like, I don't want to win this way. I've done it once, and it was like, yeah, all right, okay, I did right. it, cool. But it it it's in the deck to be the inverse of Pitiless Plunderer, because Pitiless Plunderer is your creatures, uh, and Revel and Riches is your opponent's creatures. Right. So if, if I could get an, enchant- an enchantment that's even just like one mana less to do just the first part, I would love it, you know? Or even at the same price, you know? But that's never going to happen. Right. Um, and oh. then Zorn. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I wanted to ask about Zorn just because it's a card I rarely see, but I hear a lot I hear a lot of people talking about it. Just to look at it, I'm thinking, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah, it doesn't even create treasures itself. It just, uh, it just adds one more. No, it's just a value so, machine. Yeah. Um, there, I think there are so many ways in this deck to make treasures. Uh, and it, I mean, the van- vanilla test is a three, two for three. So it's like fine. But I mean, as we'll see, as we kind of continue through this deck, we'll, uh, we'll see that like I'm making treasures more than in just these 11 cards, um, which is great because for Zorn to work, you, you do want an abundance of making treasures. Um, and you know, it's, it's the same as Jolene where like, it's just that amount plus one. So, like, it's not a huge threat, uh, especially because it can't uh, make treasures on its own. Um, unless, you know, you were to, like, put sticky fingers on it. Um, this deck really wants to do combat, but it also wants to get value out of your opponents playing with treasures. And it tries to kind of push that along, obviously starting with these 11 or 12 cards. Uh, and going from there. Because if you're making treasure, you can make your opponents make treasure. Um, even if they don't want it. I, I wish that there was more payoff in this deck to force your opponents to lose their treasure if they don't use it. Right. Um, the. I mean, but then you get into the, the whole idea of like, well, <laughs> it's optimal to just get rid of them immediately. Uh, rather than like waiting for them to use it, you know. Right, and the difficulty, you really are relying on the treasure because you need to get your commander out quickly, and commander's costs five. You know, it's not as though playing lands out are, are going to get this thing out in a hurry. So, And the longer you wait, the more likely it is your opponents will have the mana to do what they want to do anyway. Yeah. Now, to be fair, I've never met a turn where I thought, well, or it's been pretty rare when I run it, when I play a turn where I'm thinking to myself, boy, I don't need any of this mana. Um, right in those situations well yeah i it means i've got nothing yeah so and i mean like i think that 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 sentiment that you just gave right. is uh also the idea i had behind uh this next little section of a handful of cards okay um i love the idea of like being able to help out my opponents um i loved the assist mechanic in battle bond yeah we obviously don't see it enough because those no. cards are absurdly expensive, yeah. like mana wise, um, for their effects. Yeah, uh, it isn't a deal. <laughs> it's just adding adding to the price in the hopes that one of your opponents will pay some more. I mean, that's not right. Not what you're looking for. So I, I tried to keep that in mind uh, with these next few cards. Obviously, starting with Spectral Searchlight. Uh, Spectral Searchlight is a card that I think everybody should play. Uh, because, I mean, it's a three-mana mana rock that says, tap, choose a player, that player adds one mana of any color they choose. Right. Um, so, like, obviously, most of the time, you get to tap it and create a mana for yourself. But in the with regards to this deck and a lot of the decks that I put it in, I let people know, like, hey, if you need one more mana... Yeah, yeah. I am all in favor of that. Um, I like to run this in a lot of decks and... Uh, I get it. You want to run with your lock. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's obvious. Um, but you can have a lot of fun with this. If for no other reason than, um, you know, if somebody else is playing Rhystic Study and they're constantly mm. saying, do you want to pay the one? It's like, well, I, I, I got one. You, you want me to pay the one? 
I'll pay it for you. And, you know, you can have all kinds of weird, uh, you know, onboard interactions with, uh, with Spectral Searchlight. Um, and, yeah. You know, you can play it as, as goofy as you want. So, And I think, like, what kind of goes hand in hand with that is the card Victory, Tri- Victory Chimes, which yeah. is a three mana, mana rock as well. Uh, and it does the same thing, but it doesn't make colored mana. And you untap it during each other player's untaps. Yes. So it untaps four times around, and you can give it to whoever needs it, whenever they need it. Uh, you know, like you said with uh, Ristic Study, uh, it it will help pay for that as well. Cause right. It's, you know, I mean, I really utilitarian. Should... Now that you say that, I really should have Victory Chimes in my Grenzo deck. Mm. Just because, you know, it would encourage me to activate Grenzo at the end of everybody's turn. That would be amazing. <laughs> um, Pendant of Prosperity, I have not seen come out of the deck yet. Uh, but I can't wait for the day it does. It's three mana. And it enters the battlefield under the control of an opponent of your choice. Uh, two mana tap, draw a card. So they, they're activating this. Then... You may put a land from uh, a land card from your hand onto the battlefield. Pendant of Prosperity's owner, me, I draw a card, and then uh, I put a land from my hand onto the battlefield. Uh, so I'm essentially having somebody else pay two mana for me to draw a card and put a land onto the battlefield. Sure, I'm helping them draw and ramp, but, you know, like, <laughs> I don't know. It's great, uh, unless they don't use it. Then, uh, well, it would seem a small price to pay. And I mean, if your opponent really wants to, they can wait until the end of your turn or the start Mm. of the turn of the person next to you. Just so that way, you know, you're not getting to draw a card and put a land into play on your turn when you can do so much more with it. So they can limit your, your benefit a little bit. But I mean, come on, you each get to draw a card and play an extra land. Well, if yeah. you've got the I land, mean, it, go for it. You don't know if they don't even know if you have another land in your hand to play. And it's great too because it is uh, the effect is growth spiral, but colorless. Growth spiral is draw a card. You may put a land on on the battlefield. So like it's that, but it's repeated and it's colorless. So like it's just great. Um, and then uh, everyone's favorite Bucknell's Ever Everfull Purse is a two mana artifact. And then for one and tap. Roll a d4, create a number of treasure tokens equal to the result. The player to your right gains control of Bucknar's Everfull Purse. Um, This card is extremely slow. Uh, This card really can only play in uh, metas where you're going to get to turn 14. (laughs) Um, Because, I mean, everybody's going to need to take a turn before it gets to the next person. Like, it's going opposite turn order, which is unfortunate. Yeah. Yeah. Look, you're going to spend three mana and probably get two and a half treasures. Yeah. And then it's going to be a long time before it comes back to you. So I understand why some players don't want to do it. but And I mean, honestly, if you have Jolene or Zorn out or doubling season, like, I mean, you're right. you're upping that average by at least one. So, like, you're you're generally getting your money back in a form that is more useful um, because you're banking it. Right. Well, you know, and you can op- use it on a turn later. Your opponents are rolling the dice and saying they've got a 75% chance of getting more than what they put into it. The worst right. case scenario is they roll a one, get stuck with a treasure to replace the one mana they just spent. Right, exactly. There's no there's no downside. Well, the only downside uh, is that, you know, they're going to let you draw and put a plus right. one plus one counter on. And I get that's a downside, but it, it's just easy. I, I would I would yeah. do this every time and then just hang on to it because you know what? You don't have to use the treasure right away. You can sit on it, mm. you know? Uh, and if you need it right away to do something, then maybe it's worth giving, letting Andy draw a card. Yeah. Um, we're going to throw it to break yeah. real quick. Uh, and when we get back, we're going to talk about the rest of the deck. We're going to talk about what I think needs even more work on it uh, and just general excitement about Vazi. Uh, so we'll be right back. This episode of Temple of False Pod is brought to you by Spectral Searchlight. Do you just need one more mana? Spectral Searchlight. 
Now back to you. Uh, we're back with our <laughs> Fozzy deck. We we've we've only scratched the surface. I mean, not really. We've gouged the surface. There's a yeah. pretty big dent in this. Um, did, I think the the biggest clearest sign that this is in its early stages of deck building. Early, I've had this deck for a few months now. Mm-hmm. Ah, more than that, like six or seven months now. Uh, is the fact that I have four protection spells and four removal spells. Uh, I need more, <laughs> and I know I do. And like they're very specific. Uh, I've got things like Vandal Blast. Uh, I had what was the what's the green creature that destroys all artifacts and enchantments? Price oh, of progress. Yeah. No. Um, I had I had no, that in Bane here. Bane of progress. Bane of progress. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I had that in here. I took it out because like. I I just felt weird about giving everybody treasure just to take it away. And like I feel like the card synergizes so well in this deck that it's the type of thing that you almost immediately play as soon as you get it. Um I don't know no. It just like sat weird. And I might put it back in seeing that I have four removal spells. Uh one of them being Vandal Blast, obviously destroys everybody else's artifacts. Reckless Endeavor, I put in here because I just love the, like... I love the D&D cards because they're so absurd. Uh, roll 2d12, choose one result. It deals damage equal to that result to each creature. Uh, and then create a number of treasures equal to the other result. So, one might say that this is uh, more for the treasure. Uh, especially with Vazi, in, with regards to Vazi. But... It also can act as a board wipe if you need it. For seven mana, I think it's uh, pretty good value. Um, You know, you are... On average, you're getting your treasure back if you're using it for treasure. Um, Yeah. Your your average result's six and a half. You're spending seven mana on it. Grim Hireling. I feel like everybody knows this card at this point. It's a three and a black for a three-two. Whenever one or more creatures you control deal combat damage to a player create two treasure tokens so it's like professional face breaker but you create two instead black sacrifice x treasures target creature gets x min- minus x minus x until end of turn activate only a sorcery forsworn paladin i have this under removal because it gives itself death touch so it's a poor excuse for uh removal but right. it also creates treasures so you know whatever yeah uh protection uh a lot of this stuff is just kind of uh shiny impetus goads a thing so it goes another way it's protection for you as a as a player best kind uh but it also you get a treasure out of it attacking professor's warning um one mana make a thing indestructible or give it a plus one plus one uh oblivion's hunger uh gives the thing an indestructible and uh you draw a card if it has a plus one plus one already on it so it synergizes fairly well with the counters yeah and then feign death um i think i would probably end up putting more of these cards in i really like these cards uh i talked about them in something (laughs) in this show right uh i i like to just call them life insurance cards where if it dies it just comes back generally tapped but there's a bit more to it. This says, until end of turn, target creature gains when it dies. Return it to the battlefield tapped with a plus one, plus one counter. So that's a big... Oh, uh, let's... Speaking of evasion, uh, with things like... Uh, I mean, I guess I wasn't actually talking about evasion at all. Let's move on to evasion. Uh, invigorating Hot Spring, I think, uh, is pretty cool. Um, it's one green and a red uh, for an enchantment. It enters the battlefield with four plus one plus one counters on it, which I know what you're saying. It's an enchantment. (laughs) Uh, Modified creatures you control have haste, which modified, for those who don't remember, is equipment, or as you control encounters are modifications. So it's got haste. Remove a plus one plus one counter from it to put 
the plus one plus one on target creature you control which you can only activate once each turn and at sorcery speed so for free essentially you can give something haste and a counter uh, until you yeah and a counter exactly right lunar frenzy is one of my also one of my favorite cards from the past couple years uh lunar frenzy comes out of nowhere wins games uh, it says target creature you control gets plus X plus O and first strike and trample until end of turn. So even if you just play it for red, it gets first strike and trample. And it goes up from there. It's amazing. Just count your mana before going into ba- uh, into battle and you could win fairly easily. Trollbred Guardian. Um, I love creatures with this kind of thing on it. Uh, it's a 5-5 five, five for 5. It has adapt 2. Uh for two and a green it says if this creature has no plus one plus one counters on it put two plus one plus one counters on it uh and then it says each creature control the plus one plus one counter on it has trample uh we've talked about these with reference to brina because they're a lot in white um and uh i just love when it's like you're just getting extra value just by having plus one plus one counters on it uh valentine dina the vein uh, is actually in here for the, its opposite side. It's the first time I've ever looked at this green side of this card. Uh, Lisette, Dean of the Root, it's two green green for 4-4. Four, four. Whenever you gain life, you may pay one. If you do, put a plus one, plus one counter on each creature you control, and those creatures gain trample until end of turn. That's nuts. How often are you gaining life? Good question. So? I don't know. <laughs> Honestly, was afraid you'd ask. Uh, I have a few things. I I have a few things in here that'll that'll gain your life. Uh, right. It's not many, but uh, even if you were to put it on the front side, um, you're getting little little yeah. value out of it. Uh, it's it's a fine card. Yeah, I've I've got things here and there that'll that'll gain your life. Yeah, you just need to cut. Just need a couple here and there anyway. Yeah, I've got. Uh, that that's my evasion package. It's not amazing. Um, like I said, I want things that have that give haste much more. I really like invigorating Honestly, just, hot spring in this deck. Uh, I think me too. It's, it's unassuming. I know it's only three, and I know you can only activate it once a turn. But it, mm. I mean, how often are you going to need to activate it multiple times to give multiple creatures haste? You're doing it so that so just like you said. So that ancient copper dragon can can swing right away, so that so Jolene doesn't have to wait, um, right? You know, you've got all of these cards that do amazing things, and you know, a lot of times you just don't want them to wait. And hey, adding a plus one plus one counter to it, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, and uh, exactly uh, the invigorating hot spring, you know, and you know, I love to compare all this stuff with doubling season. I know it's driving everybody crazy, but. Come on, it comes in with eight plus one plus one counters and it only gives out two at a time, but it only takes one counter off to give two. I'm like, okay, so this thing is the gift that just keeps on giving with doubling season out there. I think the wild thing too is that they could have easily, just <clears throat> as easily made this a, a zero zero enchantment creature yeah. and have it be like the monkey that's in the picture. Right. Um, they definitely but the thing could is, have. is once you, once you, use up all of those plus one plus one counters it sticks around so yeah. your the modified creatures still get haste exactly and that's that's wonderful yeah um i'm not gonna go super through my card draw uh but uh some some newer additions that i've put in here is dockside chef uh, and Skullport merchant which are essentially the same creature they they both have the line for one in a black sacrifice something draw a card uh dockside chef is specifically Oh, I guess it's both artifact or creature. Great. Um, Dockside Chef, I believe, yeah, can uh, can sack itself to itself. Uh, Skullport Merchant cannot, but they're there for the card draw because this deck did not have enough like uh, reliable repeated card draw. Right. Because uh, you know you you don't want to rely on Mask of Grizzlebrand for your card draw because. You know, what if they stop killing your things? Or you're not going to want to hold off and uh, rely on Vazi for the card draw because what if they don't use treasures? I've been in that situation. It's not great. Uh, other than that, they 
do great. Um, <laughs> the the card draw, a lot of it sometimes creates treasures. You know, you've got your big score, your deadly dispute, right. uh, unexpected windfall. The rest, eh, it's what you'd expect out yeah. of this deck. Um, I'm going to quickly go through counters uh, because I don't think that there's really anything all that like wild here. Uh, we've got Ancient Bronze Dragon, which is like the Copper Dragon, but when you roll the die, it puts X plus one plus one counters on up to two target creatures. Great. Hamlet back Goliath, you get X plus one plus one counters on it every time a creature is put on the battlefield. Doesn't have to be yours, and it's X is uh, their power. So yeah, Hamlet it's back always is going to just be stupid. It's just stupid. It, it's, it's always going, to be, going to be bigger than the biggest thing somebody puts out after. So uh, yes, Nadir Agent of the Dusk. No, love this card. Yes, I want to put it in more decks. The Ozolith, of course, yes. Thundering Nightmare. I last time I played this deck, I had that out. Uh, it's wild. It does the the Ancient Animus thing, where it says uh, whenever an opponent casts a spell, put a plus one plus one counter on this creature. But it also does the soul bond thing. So you pair it with a creature when it comes in or when the, ever, or when the creature comes in. Uh, and they each get plus one, plus one counters as long as they're both on the battlefield. Uh, whenever an opponent casts a spell, which is a majority of the game. Yeah. Uh, and then I know you wanted to talk about this one. Uh, I did, mostly. With T- yeah, with Tigo. With Tigo. With Tigo. Uh, it's uh, three green, green, green. Uh, it is a zero zero creature. Uh, however, when you cast it, you get uh, six plus six one plus, plus ones. ones on it. Um, <clears throat> this thing is the reason I wanted to talk about it was mostly because uh, this thing's ancient. Uh, it has been <laughs> around since Ice Age. Uh, for the most part, it's an overpriced card because uh, it's six mana for a six six. And uh, what is it during your upkeep? Three of which are green. Right. So during your upkeep, put a plus and plus one counter on Watigo if it has blocked or been blocked since your last upkeep. Uh, remove a counter from Watigo if uh, if it uh, you, if you it has You put a plus one plus one on it if it has blocked or been blocked. Right. You take one off if it has not. Right. So um, this it gets tough because you swing an opponent, you know, and, and smart opponents just don't block. Mm-hmm. Then he gets smaller and smaller. Um, and no one swings at you unless they're swinging in the air because they want to avoid blocking, getting blocked by Watigo. And the, the downside is, you know, and then they get a creature that's big enough and they just kill Watigo off. Forget about taking a counter or whatever. Um, mm. Because it, removing the counter does not prevent the damage. So if, it, if it's a 4-4 four, four creature and it blocks a 3-3, three, three, you remove a counter and now it's a 3-3 three, three and it's taking 3 damage. It dies. Um, I just I love the card. I've run it in a lot of different decks where uh, where I'm featuring plus one plus one counters because when it comes down to it, six counters coming down, weird shit happens when you've got <laughs> that many <laughs> counters coming down all at once. It's uh, it's impressive. Um, yeah, so. especially where like a lot of the the counter synergy isn't necessarily like oh put it on this one this specific creature it's put it on a creature so like yeah if it starts to get down to like two or three like there are plenty of things in this deck that can just build it back up yeah um fun thing here too is that i i don't know if i necessarily have uh uh anthem effects but uh if it doesn't have any plus one plus one counters on it you ignore it yeah so like obviously the general case is that it's going to be a zero zero and just dies uh, but if you can pump it a little, like you can get plus one plus one pl- counters back on it and get it going. Um, but yeah, it's a it's a fun card. Uh, I think I've had it out a few times that I've played this, and uh, it's always one of those things where people kind of look at it and go, "What?" Yeah, and then they just kind of f- forget about it. Um, and generally, people don't want to take six, so they no. will block with even just a plus one plus one or with a one one token right uh, so then suddenly he's so. a seven seven the next person has to deal with um and yeah it uh it doesn't take long till that sort of thing starts to starts to get annoying yeah. for your opponents so 
We got one more, one more batch. Yeah. All right. So this batch I'm going to go through fairly quickly because I've talked about most of these on the show before. Viridian Revel. Um, this pairs nicely with Vazi because it says whenever an artifact is put into an opponent's graveyard from the battlefield, you may draw a card. I learned about this one through uh, Commander Sphere podcast because uh, it just it works so well in treasure uh, metas just generally but especially if you're pumping treasures out to people like you're drawing a card Mm -hmm. for every one that they sacrifice not not like Vazi where it's every time that they do a thing with treasures it's every time one goes to the graveyard Viridian Um, Revel is way way better than you think it is it's not even and I'm not saying you Andy I'm saying our audience (laughs) trust me on this yeah even if your meta doesn't use treasures at all. I bet they use Thopters. I bet they use Servos. Mm. I bet they have... Uh, so many of the tokens that are created are artifact tokens in some way, whether it's Clue or Food or however. They're all artifacts. So all of that is there. And on top of that, there's decks that just use a lot of artifacts. And I mean, and then you get to draw a card. Uh, that is huge. Um, it's so big. Yeah. The, the thing to keep in mind, too, is that it's not your treasures. So there's that. Yeah. So, like, you can't really necessarily control it too much. Uh, but this, th- like, the the happenstance of it all is going to be impressive. Yeah. Uh, stimulus package. Again, it's another card that I put in here because it was in New Capenna. But it also does this nice thing where it gives you an outlet in case somebody is threatening your treasures. Um, whenever... It, or when it enters the battlefield, you create two treasures. Great. For four mana, fine. Uh, sacrifice a treasure. Create a 1-1 one, one green and white citizen creature token. If somebody is threatening you with their own Vandal Blast, you pump it all into creatures, and voila, now you have an army of 1-1s. One, right. Uh, and the great thing here, too, is that because it is such a counter-heavy deck, uh, you can pump those 1-1s one, up so easily, especially with yeah. things like Ancient Bronze Dragon. Um, Nadir's Nightblade. Oh, there you go. Some life gain. Uh, whenever a token you control yeah. leaves the battlefield, each opponent loses one life and you gain one life. Right. Say you have 20 treasures out there. You sack them all, everybody loses 20, and you gain 20. Yeah. Instances of one. Um, right. <laughs> uh, Mayhem Devil. Not my favorite card uh, to play against. It's fine. Um, it's really hard to deal with because it's a 3-3. Three, three, uh, and because it does a thing that really aggravates people. Um, this would be an easy cut. Um, even if it does synergize extremely well with the deck. Maybe I would take this out and put in... Uh, what was it? Bane of Progress. Uh, who knows? Uh, it's fine. Yeah. It's it's a good card, yeah. and that's why I'm saying it's fine, because it's embarrassing. <laughs> um, Marionette Master is uh, another one that just kind of has blown up because of treasures. Uh, whenever an artifact you control is put into a graveyard, target opponent loses life equal to Marionette Master's power. It's a 1-3, but it also has Fabricate 3, so for 6 mana you can get a 4-6 because it says whenever or when this creature enters the battlefield put three plus one plus one counters on it or create three uh servos more often than not you're gonna go with the plus ones because obviously um yeah and Kalein, I mean, with vazi out there mm. i mean you know this, yeah. this thing could get ugly and it could only and once it gets like like that you know, a handful of treasures and suddenly you're doing a lot of damage. Yeah, you only really needed to, to be at five to do something ugly. Like, right. <laughs> um, because it's after every time a treasure, so like say you sacrifice four treasures while it's at five, yeah. you can do 20 damage to one person. Right. Uh, and it's a six mana creature, so like it's going to be later game anyway. Yeah. Uh, where people's life totals are a little bit lower. Yeah. Uh, Kalein creates a treasure it's a one two and whenever uh other creatures you control enter the battlefield with an additional plus one plus one counter on them for each each mana from a treasure spent to cast on it which is great um jury 
Every time you sacrifice a permanent, you get a plus one, plus one counter on jury. When it dies, you deal damage equal to its power to any target. So probably a person. Yeah. Probably. <laughs> uh, Iktekik uh, is a fun little dirtily card in this deck, as are a lot of these, obviously. Uh, dirtily in the way that you're just going to be moving dice around a lot. It's a 1-1 f- uh, one, one for 5, 4 and a green. When it enters the battlefield, create a 3-3 colorless golem artifact creature token. Whenever an artifact is put into a graveyard from the battlefield, so either yours or your opponent's, put a plus one, plus one counter on Iktekic and a plus one, plus one on each golem you control. So even if you don't get a lot of golems out there, you're getting a lot of value just from the treasures leaving the battlefield. Um, Cranial plating. I love this one. I do too. Um, a special so cranial plating I keep having on the cutting room or like on yeah like, it always like the just about block. makes the cut and then I remember it has the line black black attach cranial yeah. plating to target creature you control and I'm like oh right that's not equip so unlike equip equip is at sorcery speed this can be done at any time right for black black. Uh, yeah, so you send in it, the five creatures. Yeah. You see which, which one, ones are blocked. Yeah, which one doesn't get blocked? And then you attach cranial plating to that one and you do a pile of damage because of all the yeah uh, all the treasure tokens that you haven't used yet. Capenna Express is a card that I want just so badly to work. Um, it's a three and a green for a six six vehicle. So... Generally, on the battlefield, it's not a creature. It's just an artifact sitting there doing nothing as a 6-6. You can crew it for three, or you can crew it by sacking a treasure. It's great. Um, I wish it had, like, an activated ability where you could turn it back to a creature. Or back into a vehicle. Alas. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Away from a creature. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, And then Bloodbriar is another one of those things where it gets plus one, plus ones every time you sacrifice a permanent. Which treasures are sacrificed. Yeah. Um, so, this deck is a lot of fun. Uh, it does the things I want it to do. It, it plays the game as a table. Uh, there's there's a lot of like verbal interaction rather than like card-to-card interaction. Right. Uh, you get to choose a lot of what you want to be doing with the game. But it also does the counters thing, which I love. Uh I think, personally, this deck needs more uh, of a few things. Um, ramp. Non, non uh, treasure ramp. Um, just to get Vazi out faster. Right. Because if it's five mana, and if it dies once, it's seven mana. Yeah. Um, but also, like, Vazi is such a, like, a low threat that if you're not attacking with her, then, like... Like this, this deck generally isn't going to win with with commander damage. So if you're not attacking yeah. with her, it's not going to be this huge threat. Uh, it's going to be this like annoying fly in somebody's ear because it's going to be like, okay, I'm going to also put this plus one. Like somebody's going to use treasure, and then I'm going to be like, oh, I'll I'll put a counter here and draw a card. You know, um, so it's it's more of an annoying fly than an, like a huge threat. But I can also see how. Card advantage and bigger creatures are a threat. Uh, there's also something to be said where I need more removal, uh, right. whether it's board wipes or single target, which I just like, I don't know. I don't know how to do. <laughs> um, obviously, I could go the route of, say, like, you know, you're walking ballistas or Triskelions type thing, but um, yeah, I don't know. It's it's one of those things that it's just I it's always one of the last steps I do in the deck. Um, like I said, I need more haste for my bigger threats. Right. And in fact, uh, this deck probably needs more bigger payoffs. If I'm gonna really truly trying to be creating like massive amounts of treasure, it needs somewhere to put that treasure. Right. Rather than just a few things. Um, and, or, I mean, it's either I need more payoff, like bigger creatures, 
more big bigger creatures or I need more card draw where I can pump these treasures into drawing more cards to pump the treasures into create like just playing more like it's more about the value of being able to triple cast and like play four or five cards a turn type of thing right it, like even you can see that that dichotomy and that that schism in this deck uh even at this point of like it doesn't know which way to go um <laughs> so like to say that i'm disappointed with this deck is not true even if i do have like a lot of criticisms of my own deck building process uh but i think that like with some work it can do a lot of wonderful things and I think the thing that I need to keep in mind is that the first thing it wants to do is give other people treasure. It's it's one of those things where I need to be okay with people getting value off of my gifts. Um, and because in turn, I am like also trying to make other... Like, I, I think with giving other people gifts and them using those gifts, the threat level is going to be more aimed toward them than me. Right. Even if I am getting the value off of it of plus ones and draws and, you know, quietly right. in the background, like, building up to to take over, hopefully. That's right. the idea. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah. I always, like to th- I always like to throw in a couple of suggestions. Uh, and mm-hmm. this time around, the two suggestions I've got are... Um, because you had mentioned a little more removal. Um, yeah. And there's Flesh and Blood. It's, uh, what was it? it's a split, well, it's a split card with Fuse. So uh, the first part, Flesh, costs three, a black and a green. Exile target creature card from a graveyard. Put X plus and plus one counters on target creature where X is the power of the card you exiled. But more importantly is Blood. Uh, target creature you control deals damage equal to its power to target creature or player. So in theory, you're making one of your creatures really big and then taking out one of their uh, creatures on the board. So it's some removal there. Um, the other one I was looking at, uh, could, mostly because you would mentioned you want to have the big payoff, there's Violent Ultimatum. Uh, there, I think Ooh. there are better ways to destroy three target permanents than by you know casting a seven mana sorcery. But... Hey, violent ultimatum! You know, you get a chance to play an ultimatum. I mean, that's usually pretty good. So, <laughs> yeah, uh, and three target permanents. Uh, you can; those are permanents, not just creatures. So that spreads things out a little bit, deals with some problems that you might have an issue with otherwise. So, um, yeah, no, I love the deck, um, and you know, if you're like I said, if you're looking for more protection and more removal, I mean. The Greaves also counts as protection, so you, you do have a little more there mm. than, it, than it at first appears. Uh, I would even mark Mask of Grizzlebrand as some protection just because, uh, I mean, less the lifelink mm. and more the flying. Um, it makes it a little bit harder to hit some of the stuff you're looking at. So um, For sure. But, yeah, I mean, you make it work. Um, and I'm sure that... Yeah. Squeeze one, squeeze one card off of each of the off of the card draw the counters the evasion stack, then you've got three extras and you'll just you'll fit it. You make it yeah. work. This whole thirty six um, lands thing though, I don't know about that. I don't know about that. <laughs> I know you make a ton of treasure, so yeah, um, yeah. I was going to have a witty retort, but I don't really have one. Um, I think I was going to make some changes before I sent it to you, and okay. then I didn't. Right. So, uh, you caught me. Um, or we'll just but, delete this part, and you can do whatever you want. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, this deck... Uh, I, I've been I've been toying with the idea of, of taking apart decks, and maybe we'll talk about this in a later episode. Uh, but this deck... I is the only one lately that's been like really hitting the spot of what I want to be doing when doing deck. Um, And I think the fact that I know that it's not done and I think I know how it needs to change and what needs to be added and take it away. Like, I think uh, this is like for as mediocre as the card seems at face value and like, 
even upon initial play, it's fine. Right. Um, that's exactly where I want to be because I don't want to be, you know, all out ahead the threat, but I also don't want to be so far behind that I don't know how to catch up. Um, and I think that this is the perfect, like, for me, the perfect commander to be second or third place and then come through and win the game. Right. Um, but, uh, yeah. I mean, we, we got a few more episodes for you this season. Uh, I know we're coming up on the end of the year. We just, we just celebrated our two-year. We're going to celebrate 90 episodes very soon. And 2023. Very exciting times here. Yeah, it's very exciting times here at Temple of False Pod, where our decks are not optimized, but our plays sure as heck are fun. I'm Andy. I'm Bruce. Uh, thank you so much for listening. Have uh, have some nice, cheery holidays, if that's what you do. And uh, we'll see you next week uh, with a cool episode. That's all I'm going to say about that. Thank you again for listening. Play some magic for me, please. And may your fifth land be the temple. Bye! Wait, wait. Before you go, I uh, just wanted to say thank you for listening. You can reach out to us via email at falsepodmtg at gmail.com or on Twitter at falsepodmtg. Bruce is at Mana Burned, and I'm at Andy Weekend, though you'll definitely notice I use the podcast Twitter far more often. Now that we've got you here, make sure you subscribe, like, rate us on uh, whatever podcast platform you use. It helps us out. It gets us more reach. Subscribe to us on our YouTube channel. Uh, like a video there. Leave some comments for more casual enjoyment. Thank you so much for listening. We'll be back with some more timeless discussions about all things casual. So come hang out, and may your fit land be the temple. Bye-bye. Should I do my best, Bruce? Bye!